Nasal snuff is tobacco that is taken through the nose. The assumption with anything that goes into the nose is that it is snorted, like other things, but that's not necessarily the case with snuff. And if you do that, then you'll give yourself a very nasty shock very quickly. Snuff taking is a skill that is learned, and there are some better ways to do it than others. Much like cigars or pipes, your enjoyment of snuff depends a lot on the technique that you use. But unlike cigars or pipes, your punishment for things going wrong in your method isn't that it goes out or that you get a little bit of tongue bite, but that you feel you've gotten smacked in the head and all the tears fall out of your eyes. Have some patience. The reward for using it properly is well worth the effort. There are as many ways to use snuffs as there are different kinds of snuffs, and some of them are better suited to some snuffs than others and vice versa. I'll highlight which types of snuffs I think are best suited to their appropriate techniques, but it feel more than welcome to get creative with what you do. You own the stuff, and who am I to tell you what the wrong and the right thing to do is? Once you learn more about what you like about this and get more comfortable with the world of nasal snuff, you'll quickly discover your favorite way of taking it. My intention is for you to use this video as a starting point, not to write a prescriptive piece for everybody to follow as law. This is meant to be a complete starting guide of sorts, as much as is possible for me to do, and I will be including timestamps so that, for whatever reason you need to reference or cite this guide, you're able to do so with clarity and speed. I will also be including a PDF version of this video in the link in the description below in case you want to keep a copy of it on hand or cite the text version for a scholarly document. I recommend you check out some other videos on this subject, of course. I know that Simon from Simply Snuff over in the UK has a video on this, but I think it's a little limited in its scope. Uncle Squinty, Paul Shalbetter, has a video on it as well, but the quality has seen some years age it considerably. I myself have made a video on this in the past, but it was very early on into my channel and I feel far more comfortable with presenting information in an easy to follow format. We will be covering the different ways of taking snuff, some of the different equipment that you can use if you choose to do so, although I personally don't, and some variables that might influence your snuff taking hobby. Let's clear up some terms I think we should know before we dive deeper into this guide. Let's talk about grind. All snuff is reduced from leaf tobacco into a particle size that you can put into your nose. This is similar to, but it's not a perfect allegory, to how coffee is ground from the bean into different sizes of grind depending on the specific use case. Tobacco, likewise, is ground into snuff in different ways depending on the exact type of snuff desired by the blender. Grind has an influence on the immediacy of the punch of a snuff, along with the feel it has in the nose and the longevity of the aroma. As a general rule, more finely ground snuffs feel stronger and act instantly, although they do not last as long as coarser snuffs. Coarser snuff, inversely, is less upfront about its effect, but develops over time towards an intense and sophisticated feel. Moisture Snuff can be moistened with water, rarely other beverages, and in the case of many continental snuffs and all schmaltzers, oil. The moisture of a snuff influences almost all factors of how it takes, including the nose feel, ease of snuffing, with moisture snuffs feeling heavier and easier to take for beginners, to an extent, and the longevity of the scent and delivery, with many moisture snuffs having a longer-lasting scent and perceivably longer-lasting nicotine feel, helped by many moist snuffs being coarser cut than their drier relatives. This is not without its drawbacks. The heavy feel of moisture snuffs causes blockage in some users, and it may carry an aggressive drip with it as well. Strength Snuff is a tobacco product and all tobacco products have nicotine in them. While nicotine is not the only thing snuff takers are after when they use snuff, it is certainly a goal. Being mindful of the nicotine strength of a snuff can help you adjust your intake depending on your needs. Those who want to take a lot of snuff or find that they don't have a tobacco habit or simply use it to enjoy the scent or in company may be overwhelmed by some stronger snuffs. On the other extreme, snuff takers switching from a heavy cigarette or vape habit will find that snuffs that are strong in nicotine are more satisfying than those without, and will be more successful in their harm reduction journey if their snuff meets their needs. 
Different cultivars of tobacco have different amounts of nicotine in them, and blenders with experience in snuff blending can manipulate the proportions of these different types of tobaccos in order to adjust the nicotine inherent within the snuff. More important to the nicotine strength of a snuff than the tobacco itself, however, is the amount of pH-adjusting alkalizers within the snuff. Nicotine inside raw tobacco is trapped, and only a small amount of it can be absorbed by the body without some kind of treatment. The body absorbs the nicotine from smokeless tobacco more readily if it is presented in a high pH or alkaline environment, and so different agents are almost always included in the snuff to raise the pH. The most common are sodium carbonate, which is also called washing soda, and potassium carbonate, which is also known as potash. Although potash is a wiggly term, so I recommend sticking to the chemical names whenever possible. These are food safe in the amounts contained within snuff, and also contribute to the perceived punch and nose feel of a snuff. Alkalizers also serve a second purpose. Snuffs treated with them will release volatile ammonia as a byproduct of all the ingredients coming into contact with each other, and ammonia has a strong stimulant effect when inhaled. In most circumstances, I would say that most people would assume a snuff with a high ammonia payload and generous amounts of carbonate in the recipe to be stronger than one that actually delivers more nicotine. These things are important. The grind and moisture also affect how a snuff feels. As mentioned beforehand, finer and drier snuffs will feel more instantly punchy, but the punch will die down quicker, while coarser and moister snuffs will take a longer time to build up in their punch, but hold it at that sustained note for a greater amount of time. This is by no means a universal rule, but it is one I find holds true for myself and for many others. Now let's talk about drip, which I did mention before. When you take snuff, some of the runniness in the nose will mix with the snuff and travel down the back of your throat, resulting in back drip, a sensation that can feel aggressive to some snuff takers and may be surprising or off-putting to some beginners. As a general rule, this happens more often to coarser, moister snuffs, and especially frequently with schmaltzlers. Front drip is the same phenomenon applied to the front, giving the user the appearance of having a runny nose. Drip is a natural consequence of increased mucus in the sinusal passages as your nose tries to rid itself of foreign debris. It's nothing to be alarmed about, and many snuffs do not provoke any drip at all. But if you're switching from one that doesn't drip to one that does, it can be shocking. Rest assured, though, that everything is okay. The final term I want to talk about is medication. Snuff was used to treat the symptoms of a broad array of diseases, from mild colds all the way up to stuff like deafness and epilepsy. It is still used to treat the former in some locales, but centuries of failed attempts have not seen success in the latter two. Ingredients believed to help with soothing the symptoms of illness, such as menthol, were often added to snuff to increase its effectiveness in a medicinal context. As the runaway success of menthol cigarettes shows us, cooling ingredients in tobacco make a nice pairing, and they were soon purchased for their own merit instead of as a medicine. If a snuff is labeled as containing a medicated flavor profile, expect menthol, eucalyptus, and camphor in different proportions depending on the snuff and the blender's style inside the profile of the snuff. Let's talk about the different types of snuff that are available to you on the market. This is by no means meant to be an exhaustive list of all the types of snuff available, but these categories cover nearly all of the snuffs available for the average American or European shopper, especially when buying from retailers online. I will be twisting terms somewhat. But there are no set standards for what these terms are, save for a very few, like Schmaltzler's, has sort of a semi-rigid definition. But I think I have categorized them in a way that makes it easy for you to discover similarities between different snuffs that may not have any connection between them. The first type of snuff I'd like to talk about is the English. England has a long snuff blending tradition, and this strong association between country and craft can be seen in specific snuffs which are archetypal of that tradition. English-style snuffs are fine to medium in grind, a little bit finer than espresso ground coffee. They are moistened only with water, and they are usually perfumed or medicated. 
They are generally high in nicotine and represent the bulk of snuffs available from sellers in the UK, although the style is generally popular across the snuff-taking world and has inspired English styles from vendors and manufacturers that specialize in continental styles. Dark fire tobaccos are not often used, and if they are, it is sparing. The tobaccos used in English style snuffs are mild, even when no flavorings are added. Beginners should consider buying some English style snuffs, especially unperfumed Englishes, because they are generally easy to take and pleasant in aroma while delivering adequate nicotine. They are affordable and available nearly everywhere that snuff is sold. The next style of snuff I'd like to cover is the rapé. Rapé style snuffs, also called rapi, rapé, etc., from a French word for torn, are coarse, moist, and usually made with heavily flavored tobaccos, like Fire Cured Virginia, which has a smoky, resinous campfire flavor similar to Latakia tobacco if you're a pipe smoker. It has fermented Virginias. They also have other strong leaves. They can be flavored, but often aren't, and they deliver a strong feeling in the nose, along with being fairly high in nicotine. They are moistened with water, and they are aged to develop their scent. In South Africa, especially strong rapé-style snuffs are sold under the term guayi, which is Zulu for tobacco. These are very coarse, very moist, and extremely strong in both ammonia and nicotine, and are very popular with ex-smokers. Rapés can have an aggressive backdrop, and the flavors are strong, but I recommend trying at least one traditional rapé or guayi to see whether or not you like them. For ex-smokers, the high nicotine delivery and strong flavor are very satisfying, and I really recommend them to you if you are in this camp. Let's talk about toasts, a favorite of mine. Toasts are made with toasted tobacco, as the name implies. This is generally done by heating the tobacco at high temperatures for a short amount of time, similar to dry frying the leaf, although on an industrial scale this is often done with machines. Toasts are universally very fine and very dry, and the flavors brought out by the toasting process run the spectrum from buttery and almond-esque to the smoky notes of a lit campfire. I recommend trying at least one toast, as the aforementioned flavors are very specific to their class. They are also high in strength, both as a result of the fairly high alkalizer content in the snuff and because of their very fine grind, and are thus also recommended for ex-smokers. Schmaltzlers the name Schmaltzler is etymologically related to the German word Schmalz, which refers to animal fats in general, but more specifically to rendered duck fat or clarified butter. In the latter case, the word Butterschmalz is used. While Schmaltzlers may have originally been oiled and flavored with duck fat and butter, they are now universally oiled with a food-grade mineral oil for prevention of spoilage and for the lower material cost. Schmaltzlers are thick, very coarse, and their oiling gives them a weighted feeling in the nose with lots of flavor. They are made with heavily fermented tobacco, originally a special tobacco from Brazil fermented under compression, but now the definition has loosened to any tobaccos processed in a similar way. Expect sweet flavors of molasses, rum, sugar, moist cake, and fermentation from schmaltzers, but don't expect a lot of nicotine. They are often manufactured with very little alkalizer, if at all, and so much must be taken to feel the nicotine. They are also messier than other varieties of snuff and should be reserved for special occasions where one can take lots of snuff at once in a single session. They are not necessarily for beginners, and I wouldn't recommend that someone start with them because they are so distant from the build of more common snuffs, but curiosity, as it did for me, will eventually draw you towards them. Let's talk about something I call continental hybrids. The continental hybrids are somewhere between schmaltzlers and snuffs in grind and moisture, and they are typical of many of the snuffs popular in continental Europe. They are lightly oiled, but still contain some water, and they usually have some medication in their recipe. Some hybrids are designed as unique products from the outset. Nicolette Prise is one of them, and they are very popular. Some of them are also simply mixtures of true snuffs and true schmaltzlers that the factory produces and then mixes together. Bayern Prise is one of them, Wiesen Snuff, and there are many more. Brands that produce this type of snuff are Perschel, Bernard, and recently, as of the time of writing, Toke. 
Continental hybrids such as these are very easy to take, owing to the light oiling they receive, which ups the weight and prevents too strong of a sniff. These also have moderate nicotine as a general rule. They are very easy to recommend to anybody and can be taken at any time of day as most English style snuffs can be. Let's talk about some of the common flavors in the snuff taking world. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the flavors that can be added to snuff. And many different tobaccos and aromas are combined by blenders to create smells that are more pleasant than the sum of their parts. With that being said, let's list a couple of these more popular or notable flavors that are either inherent to or added to the snuff. Plain Snuff is made with milder leaves, like air-cured burley, virginia, or some lighter cigar leaf. These are not typically manipulated beyond the selection and blending. Notes that are going to be common to Plain Snuff are baked goods, aged paper, cocoa, sweet potato, nuts, and oatmeal. Fire-cured tobacco is smoked for a long time in a process that is reminiscent to smoke-curing meats such as sausage or jerky. Fire-cured tobaccos are usually used as condimental tobacco in pipe blends, in the construction of Italian cigars like Toscano, or as the base for dipping tobacco, but their inclusion in snuffs gives the recipe an exquisite, bold, and smoky flavor that can't be found anywhere else. They are usually turned into repay-style snuffs, and they are sometimes added to schmaltzlers. Madras snuffs are those which the base tobacco has been fried in ghee, and many of them have a heavy taste of butter as a consequence. The majority of Madras snuffs are manufactured in India, the place of origin. SPs. The name SP originates in Sales Pollard, a very old and now long defunct snuff manufacturer once well known across London for their particular blend of English snuff, scented with a complex and lengthy list of oils. Although bergamot, which is a citrus fruit found in the Mediterranean and known nowadays mostly as the scent of Earl Grey tea, is the predominant scent. SP snuffs nowadays are likewise more or less English style snuffs scented with bergamot at the forefront and other oils in the back scent. And all, save for a few exceptions, have this very pleasant aroma at the crossroads between fresh baked sourdough bread and the men's cologne section at a department store. Let's talk about florals. Snuff scented with the extracts of flowers are not uncommon, and perfuming snuff in this way makes sense, considering snuff's golden age coinciding with a time where confectionery flavored with spices and flowers like rose water, orange blossoms, and other things like this were far more popular than they are today. Floral scents either take the form of a blend, as they do in SP snuffs, or are singularly scented. Neroli, which is that orange blossom we mentioned, lavender, and rose are still extremely common as standalone snuff scents. Fruits are ever-popular flavors for anything under the sun, and snuff is no exception. Berry flavors, exotic fruits, and citrus are all present. Some are less artificial than others, although artificial does not necessarily mean that a snuff is bad, just artificial. Menthol and fruit are very common pairing, so expect to see a lot of those if you go out looking for a fruit-flavored snuff. Herbs are not ordinarily used as standalone scents for snuff, but their extracts can be found in nearly every complex blended snuff, and they add a depth that would not be present otherwise. Herbs that are often used in snuff are that aforementioned lavender, bay leaves, mints, which have their own section below, and many, many others. Spices, as with herbs, are not found as standalone scents too often, although some more popular spices like ginger and cinnamon are notable exceptions. Nutmeg and clove are two spices that make their way into many blends to add character to the aroma. Once again, let's talk about medication. It's already been covered earlier in this guide, but it remains an incredibly popular flavor and should be mentioned again. The classic medicated trio is usually a mix of menthol, camphor, and eucalyptus. So let's talk about those right now. Menthol is not necessarily a flavor, but instead a chemical that introduces a stimulus to the body, in this case, the nostrils. In much the same way that capsaicin tricks the body into thinking it is warm, but is unrelated to the flavors of peppers from which it has been extracted, menthol is purely cooling without any of the aroma of mint. It is included in many snuffs, as many find menthol to be pleasant and refreshing, but beginners should limit their menthol intake as it tends to disguise other flavors and can cause blockage in some snuff takers, especially those who are new to menthol snuffs. Camphor 
is a waxy extract from certain trees with a smooth, cold, medicinal smell. Many people will recognize the smell as one of the major cooling compounds of muscle-soothing ointments like Bengay or Tiger Balm. It is usually not used by itself except in some artisan blends, but it has the same cooling effect as menthol. Eucalyptus oil is sharp, cooling, in a similar way to camphor and menthol, and is almost never included by itself but in blends to form medicated snuffs. Related to medication, but not medication itself, is going to be mint. Mints, namely spearmint and peppermint, are included in this section because of their cooling property, courtesy of that menthol present in mint plants. Spearmint is an extremely popular flavor for nasal snuff and has a zesty, grassy note that makes it a delightful snuff for beginners and long-time snuff takers alike. I recommend mint-flavored snuffs to beginners more than medicated snuffs simply because of their more aromatic and less sharp character. Also, semi-tangentially related to medication, but is very rarely found in snuff, is wintergreen. Wintergreen is extracted from the leaves and berries of a small evergreen plant found principally in the north of the United States and Canada. It has a cooling effect that is similar to the aforementioned additives, but it has a mild sting to it that many find pleasant. Americans will be especially attracted to wintergreen, as it is the flavor of root beer and many American confectionaries, but to many Europeans it registers as a very medicinal taste, a very strange taste. Wintergreen is, again, not a popular flavor for nasal snuff, but it can be sometimes found. Now let's talk about techniques. There are as many ways to take snuffs as there are snuffs themselves. Let's go over as many of these techniques as I can remember and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of all of them. The pinch. Pinching your snuff is the most basic way of taking it. All one does is simply reach into the snuff, pinch a small amount of it, somewhere around the size of an apple seed, between the thumb and one of the fingers, it doesn't matter which one, you hold the pinch to the nostril and smell strongly and consistently for about one second while rolling the finger back to reveal more snuff to the nose. This is repeated for the second nostril, the fingers are dusted off, and it's over. Pinching is the quickest way of taking snuff that is sold in a tin, but it is far from the easiest to master. There is a risk of taking the snuff too far back into the nose, either by holding the snuff too close to the nose, or by sniffing too sharply. I find that a slow sniff and a slight wiggle of the pinch in your fingers as you smell prevents disaster, and allows you tighter control over where the snuff goes. For beginners, I recommend pinching snuffs that are finer and drier, such as English snuffs and toasts, as coarser or moister snuffs might be compressed by the pinch and not snuff quite as well as with some other techniques more suited to their construction. The Boxcar to take your snuff with the boxcar method, hold your index finger out as if you were pointing. Pull your thumb close to it, running parallel to it, and then wrap your index finger around its tip. If you've done it correctly, there should be a small dimple between the tip of your thumb and the crook of your index finger when snuff can be placed and taken from. The boxcar is well suited to snuffs that come out of tap boxes. A small amount can be tapped into the boxcar and snuffed out of it. The distance the boxcar creates between your nostril and the snuff prevents it from being pulled too far back in most cases, and large amounts of snuff can be taken without discomfort. All sorts of snuff are well suited to the boxcar, but the technique works especially well with continental hybrid snuff such as Gleche Prisa, which are almost always served out of tap boxes or bottles. Let's talk about the anatomical snuff box now. If you curl your thumb back with your fingers half extended, a small divot will appear where your thumb meets your wrist. This is called the anatomical snuff box, so named because snuff can be placed and taken off of it. Although I find snuff to be taken off of flat planes of the skin to be a very comfortable way of taking it, I don't think that this part of the body is necessarily the best place to do it. Snuff can really only be placed there one pinch at a time, and the back of the hand presents a far more spacious and comfortable place to take snuff. In cases where the snuff can be tapped out of a tap box, the boxcar is a much more compelling technique to use as well. Nevertheless, it is included here for the sake of completeness, and it's because it's a historically mentioned method. Let's talk about the back of hand method. In the German-speaking regions of Europe, especially Switzerland, 
snuff is often tapped onto the back of the hand and taken from there. To use the back of the hand method, just place or tap out two small bumps of snuff, lean in close, and snuff them. With a tap box, this method is extremely neat, and even from a tin, the lid can be used as a small spoon to shovel and portion two small bumps of snuff out to the back of your hand. I like this method, and use it about as much as I do the boxcar method, especially with schmaltzlers and hybrids that benefit from a larger dose. In much the same way that snuff can be placed on and taken from the back of the hand, one can place snuff into the divots of the knuckle and take it from there. I find no realistic advantage to this over the back of the hand or the anatomical snuff box, but I've included it again to be thorough and because it is often mentioned in German-speaking countries as a popular way to take snuff. The Spoon Small spoons have been used for centuries, either to truck snuff from a container to the back of the hand, or to lift it directly to the nostril. While there is nothing wrong with using a spoon, it adds an additional layer of complexity to what can be a very simple process if simpler techniques are used. However, spoons are very handy if you prefer taking finer snuffs off the back of the hand or using the boxcar method, as these are usually sold in tins that really only allow for quick and clean taking as a pinch. Alternatively, the lid of the snuff tin can be used as a spoon in the same respect, and this is especially popular in Africa for the coarse guayu snuffs, like Nsu and Taxi. The lid of the tin is plastic and is folded into a pointed shovel that serves the same purpose as a spoon with the same precision. Snuff bullets are used to deliver a small amount of snuff directly into the nostril by way of a sealable chute that you stick up your nose. I don't recommend using snuff with them, as snuff bullets are really intended for snuffing things other than snuff, to the point where many of them have a carburetor intending for snorting things far deeper into the nose than snuff has any right to be. They also break easily. However, they are included here for the sake of being thorough. In the German-speaking world, but specifically in Switzerland, contraptions are built to deliver snuff into the nose. These fall into two camps. Machines meant to deliver the snuff as quickly as possible to the snuff taker, used as novelties at parties mostly, near those who may be completely unfamiliar with snuff and more comfortable taking it if it is thrown into their nose, and snuff machines built to be as elaborate, stylish, and mechanically contrived as possible, all for the sake of good fun. They are impressive, but in no way quicker or cleaner than just taking a pinch, and, unless you're a collector, you don't really need one. The Polish rail is a forbidden technique used by teenagers in Central Europe wherein the snuff is divvied up into rails and snorted. I present it here to teach you that there is a wrong way to use snuff because the only result of this behavior is a watery nose, strong coughing, and wasted snuff. Now let's go over some tools, some essential, some less than essential. One that I think everybody needs is the handkerchief. Snuff involves sneezing and blowing the nose. While paper towel is perfectly acceptable, if you're planning on using snuff out and about, you should at least have one handkerchief laying around that you can carry with you in your pocket. A good handkerchief is soft, dark in color to camouflage stains, and should be reusable. Cheap ones can be bought from any convenience store, and good ones can be bought online for far cheaper. Cotton makes the best handkerchief because it's soft and affordable. Mirrors are also useful sometimes. Snuff can stain or leak from the nostril, and this can sometimes be embarrassing, especially when you have to attend a meeting or somewhere where appearance is critical. If you have a mirror, good, but a smartphone camera does the exact same thing and is more compelling to carry around. Traditional snuff boxes are small, sometimes flashy, sometimes not, and can be found in a variety of forms. The most popular ones have a lever lid or a slide lid, and they are great for decanting snuff into, but often leak or allow air to enter through tiny gaps in the material. If you're a beginner, you may be tempted to buy a fancy snuff box to help you feel distinguished. This is unnecessary. As there are no advantages to using one compared to what a snuff box ordinarily comes in in every circumstance. If you would like to decant snuff into something, I do print some tap boxes that I keep for sale on my eBay store, and while these do make it very easy to take snuff, they are again redundant if you're comfortable with the pinch. Buy one if you're into English snuff though. A lot of snuffs are sold in this terrible metal tin that spills everywhere. 
Top boxes have been mentioned several times in this guide, but it's important that I clarify exactly what they are. Snuff that was historically sold for decanting into bottles that can be tapped out onto the back of the hand or the box car is now sold into small, easy to manufacture, and easy to use containers that have a small, resealable hole at the top that the user can use to portion out snuff. I find these to be almost perfect packaging for snuff, which is why I sell them on my store. This style of snuff box is far more common in Europe than in the UK or America, but small, coin-shaped tap tins are now available outside of the continent. These leak everywhere, and allow a tremendous amount of air contact with snuff in storage, but the coin shape is very slick looking. Let's go over some things to remember if you're getting into snuff taking. Checking yourself after taking snuff. Snuff can be messy sometimes. If you feel that you have some crumbs on your nose, or that your nose is running, chances are that you do, and that it is. Be sure to check yourself frequently for signs of detritus until you get into the habit of automatically cleaning yourself after every pinch. Blowing your nose is also important. You should blow your nose often when taking snuff, because snuff that blocks your nose not only slightly restricts your breathing, but also prevents additional snuff from taking full effect when snuffed up. Keep a handkerchief nearby and blow your nose in the shower to make sure you're clean in the morning or at night, whenever you usually bathe. I'm going to talk about menthol rebound as well. Menthol and medicated snuffs can cause a condition called rebound, where the nasal passages that were widened or cleared by use of a medicated snuff swell slightly after in response to the snuff. The effect, when it happens, because it isn't consistent, although anecdotal reports claim that it's far more common in snuff takers who are new to menthol snuffs, is bothersome, and these can cause difficulty in clear breathing. My recommendation is to not to go heavy on the menthols, and to alternate your use between snuff that contains it and snuff that doesn't. Rebound usually happens anywhere from a couple of hours to a day after use of the menthol, meaning some snuff takers may not link the ingredient with their feeling. A question I often get asked is where does the snuff go? This is a question asked often, and the simple answer is that much of it either drops out of the front when you're not looking, or drips back down the throat in small and unnoticeable amounts. Some of it does stay in your nose, however, so you should be mindful of this and blow your nose at least once a day after taking snuff. How much do you need to take and how often? As much as you feel comfortable taking, as often as you feel comfortable taking it. Tobacco will inform you when you're taking too much by poisoning you. The symptoms of which are dizziness, nausea, malaise, strong headache, powerful lethargy, and things like that. A cure for nicotine poisoning that I find works is placing a tablespoon or two of sugar under the tongue, which usually helps one feel better very quickly, as one of the effects of nicotine poisoning is low blood sugar. Most snuff takers have said that their use depends on how they feel or what they're doing, but the frequency of the pinch usually hangs around the once every hour mark to once every 15 minutes, dependent again on the situation. Now, let's cover snuff expiration and storage. Snuff does go dry, and it loses its flavor and potency along with its moisture. After blending, an average snuff will last anywhere between 6 months to 2 years in retail packaging, although this varies tremendously depending on the storage situation and the packaging itself. I recommend that if you're buying snuff in bulk, that you wrap the seam in vinyl tape and store it in the most airtight, cool, and dry place you can find. There is no need to be overly pedantic about this, and by a specialized snuff humidor, you can keep the snuff tins in Tupperware, put them away in a cupboard and drawer, and this is usually more than enough. So how do you get snuff? Understand that I've written this from an American's perspective. In some countries, finding nasal snuff will be as easy as going down to the corner store. Luckily, the United States is one of the most snuff bear countries, so all these difficulties turn into worst case scenarios. Only in two countries, Canada and Australia, can I imagine that snuff is harder to acquire. The USA is a large country and different regions have different products. As mentioned before, the southeast is especially lucky for people hunting snuff because many grocery stores still keep a selection in stock for a small number of dedicated users. Most of these are American scotch snuffs, which are a relative of toasts made usually with a percentage of fire-cured tobacco and they are ground extremely fine. 
The selection isn't tremendous, but it is available. Elsewhere, check specialty tobacco shops. Head shops, which can sometimes be reliable when it comes to hookah, fail us in this regard. If a store sells pipes and cigars, but especially pipes and pipe tobacco, ask the clerk where they have any nasal snuff. Most of the range won't be on proud display unless you're in a college town where curios are popular, but they might have some under the counter. I know that the situation is different in other countries. In the UK and in Central Europe, many corner stores have at least a few key top sellers in stock, and failing that, most tobacconists that aren't just cigar shops should have some snuff available. If you're in Brazil, although I can't confirm this personally, I have been told that the selection of domestic snuffs is fantastic, although they are still carried only mostly in rural counties or by specialty shops. You could also go with an online retailer. In the Americas, most online retailers will ship to North America, but there are exceptions. I know and have ordered from Token Mr. Snuff, but other companies do ship into the United States. As for the United Kingdom, they benefit from the greatest selection of online retailers willing to ship to them. In addition to those mentioned, British residents can also order directly from the Crystals and Wilsons of Sharrow, as well as from a range of retailers on the continent and elsewhere. Europeans also enjoy a broad selection of different retailers willing to ship to them, with most of those mentioned having roots into the continent. Domestic options exist also, but sometimes these are very localized. Switzerland enjoys some of the greatest freedoms in tobacco vending, and many retailers ship a very wide range of snuffs if you're in that country. Eastern Europe, especially Poland and Czechia, also see many online vendors. You could also make snuff yourself. It's not hard to create something that compares closely with manufactured products, and is the reason this channel exists. I have made videos on this subject in the past, so if you want to check those out, links will be provided in the description. Thank you so much for joining me. I really liked putting all this information together, and I hope if there are some beginners out there who are hoping that snuff will get them off of the cigarettes, off of the vapes, I can tell you personally it's a fantastic option, and I think nothing else besides snus comes even close to the harm reduction potential that this unique and historical product offers. If you like this video, or like the topic, go ahead and check out my other videos on my channel. I have lots of DIY videos, lots of historical essays, and lots and lots of reviews on nasal snuff in particular to help you find out which ones you think you'd like to add to your collection. Please like, share, subscribe. If you want to support the channel, I do have links in the description from some things I've mentioned in the video. You can also support me on my Patreon or leave a super like. Thank you so much, and I hope I'll see you again. Bye-bye.